And I want to thank so much um, the, our guest today, because Chris Judge uh, claims his tribe is from Ireland. And he has had to take time off from the battle that the Irish do every every St. Patrick's Day to uh, prevent taking over the world. And Chris Judge is somebody that I've known and respected for a long time, and he makes his money digging in the dirt, which is a delightful hobby, and actually, <laughs> if you get paid for it, it's even better. And he's an archaeologist of some repute, and the associate director of the University of South Carolina Center for Native American Studies in Lancaster, South Carolina, for the past 12 years. He's nodding yes. So Chris, come up here and tell us what we're going to do today, and be sure to uh, appropriately introduce the person that's with you later. Thank you, Brett. Good to be back. Um, last time I was here, we talked about deep history starting in the Ice Age and moving into the historical period and up into the present. Uh, today, I want to introduce my friend, Terrence Lily, uh, Littlewater, um, who is a Native American. Uh, she's not a South Carolina Native American. She'll tell you about herself in a second. Um, she works with a lot of contemporary uh, Native people in South Carolina. In particular, she works with a lot of the um, issues that are facing uh, Native Americans. She's the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission. Uh, she works with the Indigenous Women's Alliance. Uh, I don't know more South Carolina. Uh, Native American Veterans and Active Duty Association. Uh, Spirit of Eagles Project, Restorative Bust to Justice Project, and 17227 Two Spirit Project. Um, I've asked her to come today, as she did last year, and talk to us about um, missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is a really huge project in, in, in South Carolina, and I don't know more, and then the Indian Child Welfare Act, among other things. And uh, if she forgets to cover some of the topics that I'm interested in, I will ask her a question and the audience feel free. And then when she's done, we'll turn it over to the audience, both here and on Zoom, to uh, ask us questions about what was presented today or go into a deeper dive on anything that was presented last time. Um, so with that said, uh, Terrence, Lily, Littlewater, take the podium. Thanks, Chris, very much. And thank you, Brett, again, as always, for inviting me to speak. Hi to everybody. Hello. How do I say hi to the folks behind me? They're here, and you're talking to that microphone there. Okay. So don't turn around and talk to them. I mean, you can turn around, but you gotta, your voice has got to go to that microphone. But they can, they can see me they, from They front. see you now. So you look at yourself in there. You can look at yourself. Look at there you go. Okay. <laughs> hi. <laughs> I just wanted them to be acknowledged. Um, how is everybody today? Happy, uh, we call it the Colonize Ireland Day, sort of where we are here. Um, Chris, you mentioned that Chris was Irish. My father is also Irish American. He is from, his family is from a little village in uh, Donegal County called Dunfennehy. Um, are you familiar with that, Chris? Have you ever? I know Donegal. Donegal, Dunfennehy is on the northernmost tip of Ireland. And of course, we have a joke that we would be named after a village called Fenn, because when you say it in Irish, it sounds like Fenn. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mother is and I am Ocheti Sekowan, Minikandi Ocheti Sekowan. Uh, Ocheti Sekowan are the seven bands of the Lakota. Um, Minikandi is the band that my mother's family is from and that I am from. Um, we do not call ourselves Sioux. I think a lot of people would like for us to be called Sioux because that's what they're used to. Uh, I've been taught since I was a child to never use that word. There is some controversy about where that came from. Um, the most believable to me is that the Ojibwe at the time um, called us Nadawasi, which meant cutthroat traders somewhat because we apparently were that for them, perhaps. Um, someone asked them who we were, and that's what they called us. And so Sue kind of got shortened from that. There's another thing that said that the French 
spelling, of course, that is a French spelling, um, comes from somewhere, a little snake or something of that sort. So there's kind of some different ideas about exactly what that word, where that word was derived and why we're called that, but we don't call ourselves that anyway. So to be honest with you, we don't care. Um, it's just, we just don't use it. So um, as I said, I am the Chief Executive Officer of the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission. Um, I have been the Chief Executive Officer for the last 17 years. Prior to that, I was the Executive Director and I started out as someone calling me and saying, are you Terrence Littlewater? And I said, yeah. And I think this is in like 1990. And they said, aren't you getting something going in, in Columbia? And I said, yeah. And he said, this is Chief Gilbert Blue. Um, I want to start this organization of all the Native Americans uh, tribes in South Carolina. And I'm having trouble getting organized. And my friend Dewey Adams, who's one of our councilmen, met you. Could you come and help us? Um, I didn't realize I was being handed like a boulder at the time. Um, I remember being so frightened of the first meeting that I went to with all the chiefs because I didn't know them that my, I had my mother come and sit across from me so she, I could look at her when I felt like I was going to pass out. Um, <laughs> and she handed me the book, Phenomenal Woman, um, and wrote a little note in the front page. And I looked at it right before I got started. And it said, you are a phenomenal woman. And I, I opened it up and I read the page. And then I kind of settled down and felt like, well, maybe I can do this after all. Um, and so I was extremely young. Um, I'm not anymore. And right now, I think the most exciting thing that's happening in South Carolina is the, the wave of younger people that are starting to come into this and become leaders. It is really, really amazing when you have, you watch young people dance at a powwow since they were maybe eight or nine years old or even brought as their mother as a baby, somebody wants you to say, oh, this is my baby. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing this baby on tribal council. And I'm seeing this young person that was a teenager walk up to me and say, how can I help with the missing and murdered indigenous women issue? And step on a committee and see them be so incredibly skilled and passionate and knowledgeable and educated. Um, to me right now, that's the most exciting thing that's happening. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about exactly what we do. Um, we started out as a South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission as the Council of Chiefs, and it started out just being in about 1985. All the chiefs would just get together and talk about all the issues that they were dealing with. At the time, there were no state-recognized tribes whatsoever. And my job was to take notes and set all the meetings and make sure that everybody got there. Um, anybody that didn't have money to eat, or to uh, gas to get there because everybody was running around on, well, and still do, with uh, their own gas and paying for their own hotels and things like that, trying to just take up donations between the chiefs and make sure that that got spread out amongst everybody. Everybody had, you know, enough money to get there. So it started out as a very, very small thing, but it was a very, very powerful thing because it was the first time in the history of South Carolina that all of the chiefs started getting together and talking about what was going on in their individual areas. A lot of these tribes, I'll kind of give you an example, um, and Chris could probably even chime in and tell you more about this than I can. Um, I have only learned by like my experience with them and with, with working with them about their histories and also to working on state recognition. We went through a lot of the um, history since, even since um, first contact. But uh, the Edisto, uh, Natchez Cuso tribe, um, they have been in the same area for ever. Um, and their church is kind of in the middle, and then the community is kind of built in rings around it which is probably exactly the way it started. It was probably a meeting place in the middle. It's kind of the church kind of sits on a mound. Have you noticed that, Chris? Kind of mounded where the church sits. So more than likely that was a mound where there was a meeting place or some type of um, like, I, I don't want to call it a longhouse because that's sort of a different tribe's term for it. But, um, and then of course you have the circles, which is very, very traditional with most native people that they live in circles um, around whatever their community building was so they could all help each other. and. 
um, for defense purposes and, and a lot of other spiritual things, a lot of different things. So they still live in a very, very traditional communities, but they live in places where that shielded them, where they could not be found. And, you know, a lot of these chiefs, their grandfathers knew each other, their grand great grandfathers knew each other. They knew each other, but they didn't particularly work together. They stayed in very, very separate communities because at the time it was safer that way. And they kind of fell through the cracks. So in South Carolina, one of the biggest difficulties with state recognition and with um, all kinds of other documentation and um, things, systems we have to negotiate because become extremely difficult because after the Civil War, when censuses got taken, the main concern was, are you white or are you black? There was no such thing as mixed race. And you'll even notice in South Carolina, it's a very, very difficult thing for people to comprehend. You're, you've got to be one thing or the other. You can't be a little bit of everything, you know. Um, and you can't be a white looking Native American or a black looking Native American. It's either you're white or you're black. I've actually had people say, but but you're white now. <laughs> and I've had people say to my friends, but you're black now. Um, it's a really difficult position to be put in. So, you know, at the time, tribes stayed where they were. And that really actually did preserve their cultures and their and you know, the tribe itself, you know, the family staying together and staying very, very insulated. But then, of course, you know, we started taking censuses and we started finding people and things started happening. And so, you know, people began to realize that these communities existed, but they didn't know what they were. And um, most of the time when censuses were taken, and if you'll go back and you'll look at tribal roles now um, for state recognized tribes, we very first started looking at them it was really tough because we would start comparing it to censuses and we start comparing it, comparing it to other documentation. We start comparing it to birth records. We start comparing it to where tribal members went to school. You would have a brother that would have gone to a white school. You would have a sister that would have gone to a black school. They would have the same parents. There were some Indian schools in South Carolina, but if you were black or if you're white, you probably wouldn't have gone to one of those either. So it just, it got very, very convoluted and very, very difficult to figure out. Plus we have a thing in South Carolina called othering. Um, still now we're fighting this and some of the issues that we're working on and it's causing problems. Um, you will look at a form. I went to get a flu shot but this past year. Um, I went to um, the... MUSC health system, and they have a form that you fill out for a flu shot. So I'm standing, fill out my form, and I get to the little box where you check for your race. And it says white, black, Hispanic, Asian, other. Um, so that whole being other thing in South Carolina is really a problem. There's never been a box in so many different types of situations and institutions that you can check that says you are a Native American person. Um, one of the chiefs on the Council of Chiefs who has passed away, his name is Chief Gene Norris. He is the one who put forth a bill with one of his senators where you could actually designate that you were a Native American person on your birth certificate in South Carolina. This was in 19, no, two, 2003, 2004? Yeah, it was late, <laughs> late. Um, so being that, that other thing is a huge is issue. So kind of where I'm leading to is, um, Brett asked me to kind of mention and talk about some of the difficulties of being a Native American in South Carolina. I can't really address that as a person being um, indigenous Native American to South Carolina because I am not. Um, my family is from the Beaufort County Sea Island area. That is where um, my dad's family is from, and they are mostly Irish people, as I said. Um, but I have watched, like I said, these processes happen where 
there's just no recognition of any kind. And before there was actual state recognition of tribes, it's like you just basically didn't exist. Everybody thought everybody in South Carolina who's Native American, that was probably Cherokee. I mean, I know a chief who grew up as a little boy who got so sick of having to explain what his tribe was that he got, well, he just said Cherokee. Because that's what everybody expected. There are 10 tribes in South Carolina that have state recognition. So this is what the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission started out to do when it began is that all this othering and all of the problems that were occurring with Native people, it seemed that there was some form of government to government relationship, Go tribal governments, South Carolina state governments, that it would be easier for them. I can say with 99% confidence, that wasn't so. Um, it got easier, but other parts of it got harder. Bureaucracy always makes things harder. It wasn't a panacea, but it was a step in the right direction. Now, a lot of tribes are also right now in the process of applying for federal recognition. So what does that mean? Federal recognition means that your tribe has a, their government, tribal government, to the federal government relationship, like a treaty. There are 673 federally recognized tribes in the, in the United States. Um, the federal recognition process can sometimes take 50 years. Um, you have to prove since first contact. The laws have changed on that as well. Um, it used to be a nice little process where you turned in your um, your information that you had um, or your research and you know your packet and they would look at it and they say okay well this is missing this needs to be improved whatever they would give it back to you you could you know keep working on that for as long kind of as you needed to um now you get it's a one-shot deal you turn it in it's either right or wrong you're done so that's federal recognition going through the bureau of indian affairs Another way is with an executive order by the president. And there's a third way. And I think I have forgotten that because nobody uses it. <laughs> uh, U.S. court. Yes, thank you. Going through the court, um, which is kind of what pretty much Tabla did, didn't they? Because I remember all of that too is going through the court. On um, no tribes treaty or agreement with a government is the same. That's another thing that's confusing. That's why Indian law is so confusing. Um, not only are we completely separate cultures, each nation is a separate culture, our, our agreement and how we work with the federal government can be completely different. Everyone assumes, okay, well, you get federal recognition, you get a re reservation, right? No, every tribe does not have a reservation. Um, when the Catawba were going through their process through the court system and with the South Carolina state government, because they had to deal with South Carolina state government, they had absolute undeniable proof that the land belonged to them. It wasn't theirs, but it had already been settled by non-Indians. So they said, okay, fine, we'll take the money. We'll buy other land. So they own their land. It is not trust land. So I'm just giving you an example. You know, don't expect everybody's agreement to be the same. Nothing is the same. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, myths around those type of agreements. Um, nobody gets checks. Nobody gets money. Nobody gets anything free. Um, we compete with um, minority scholarships pretty much like everybody else. There are some colleges that have special programs for Native Americans. Really about the only thing that we are guaranteed and you know, living this with my tribe all my life is Indian health services. I don't get it because I don't live where my tribe is located. I probably could go to Charlotte um, and use Indian health services there. I never have. So, because I don't think it's worth my time because they just do like very, very few. They might be able to like give you antibiotics or a few things. It's like more like a clinic. It's not a hospital. So it's just not worth it. Um, so you have to remember that all of that is different. 
So I'm going to read off the South Carolina state recognized tribes. And the reason why I read these off now is because about the last two years since I've gotten older, I always miss somebody. I can't figure out why that is true. I used to be able to pop them up like this. And now I always miss somebody and they hear about it and they get mad at me. So, of course, the Catawba Indian Nation is federally recognized. The state recognized tribes are the Beaver Creek, Beaver Creek Indians, Edisto Natchez Cuso tribe, the PD Indian Nation of Upper South Carolina, the PD Nation tribe of South Carolina, um, the Lower Eastern Cherokee Nation of South Carolina, Santee Indian Organization, the Sumter tribe of Shira Indians, the Waccamaw Indian people, and the Wasamasa tribe of Varner Town Indians. Have you heard of any of these? Yay! <laughs> I sure am glad to hear that. That's great. Um, so we have the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission is set up with satellite committees. The South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission is actually the business portion of this. Um, back when we were doing all this work regarding state recognition, we were also beating down doors at the state house and with the legislature for a standalone Indian Affairs Commission. We've never gotten that. And so what we decided to do in 1994 was do it ourselves. If you're not going to do it for us, we're going to do it ourselves. Um, the Commission for Minority Affairs um, was put in charge of state recognition when uh, Governor Hodges formed an ad hoc committee um, trying to figure out how to help us get state recognition. He honestly has been the only governor who's ever helped us, so I cannot speak ill of this at all. Um, but now the Minority Affairs Commission have has taken over some things that we didn't ask them to do. So it's all been kind of a bit confusing. Um, but I do want to mention them that they certainly have their place in helping us do what we need. But at the same time, we're the ones who know our needs and we are the ones who consistently have been working on them for decades. Um, so we have quite a few different committees that work on different things. Um, the first one I'm going to mention is the Council of Chiefs. And I know that Brett and um, Chris both are very familiar with this particular committee that we have. And what that is, is that's all the chiefs of the state recognized tribes. We also have state rec what's called state recognized groups, which is a completely different thing. Um, and sometimes they will come and meet as well with the council of chiefs because, you know, they have similar situations going on. And if so, then, you know, they're all going to get together on that particular issue. So what they do is they deal with the kind of the political needs, the government to government type relationships um, with South Carolina with the South Carolina state governments. They're the people who, um, well, they're not the only committee, but um, they work on a lot of laws that are going to deal with like wholesale laws that deal with tribes and that kind of thing. Um, and so they meet usually four times a year and keep up with each other in between time. Because I'm going to be honest with you, most of these chiefs are all friends, they know each other, they're constantly on the phone with each other. So I can't say that the Council of Chiefs meets four times a year. It's like a moccasin telegraph that just basically never stops. It's like a circular thing, um, which is very normal for us anyway. Um, also, there is um, the Indigenous Women's Alliance of South Carolina. And this was begun because there was a Council of Chiefs and we noticed that there were a, a lot of women were doing the work behind those chiefs um, and, you know, kind of buying into that patriarchal system of, you know, let's keep the women over here as the secretaries and going to get the water, but we're going to stand out in front of everybody and tell everybody we're the boss. So, um, and plus, too, you know, it's just, it's just historical in tribes that women are usually the people who form the consensus of the people and kind of carry the, the how everyone is feeling, let's put it that way. You know what I mean? They're kind of kind of they're into the family systems and that kind of thing. So you know that's that's kind of normal anyway. Um, so we formed an Indigenous Women's Alliance to give women a voice. Um, and wow, do they ever have a voice. And we're really, really proud of the things that they have accomplished. Um, they have done eight, so far eight surveys 
um, that has told us really more about Native Americans in South Carolina, I think that's ever been known. We didn't even know all these things. And these are things that we needed to know because you can't, you can't resolve problems if you don't know exactly what the problems are. You also can't get support for it without data. Um, we never started doing this. One of the first things that we did, we started going to legislators when we wanted to talk about state recognition and uh, a standalone Indian Affairs Commission. They said, well, how many of you are in my district? We don't know. You know, it was eye-opening and embarrassing at the same time. Um, we have never we have never been able to define that in every district in South Carolina. And this, this is when we discovered one of the reasons why that other box is so important. Um, we went to the election commission and sometimes it's who you work with that's important. The person who was the head of the election commission at the time literally sat us all down, went down the hall, printed out a, um, computer printout of every um, person in South Carolina that he thought might be Native American, like they had a Native American name. I'm not sure how he did it, it was like this. So we started going through it. It was absolutely hilarious. Um, and then he said, well, I, I don't, we said, it's kind of funny. It's like mess around and find out. Um, he said, well, I don't know how to tell who's Native American, who's not. We said, well, that's what we're telling you. This is this one guy at Shire Force Space, his name is Big Yellow Eagle. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Um, so it, he it became very, very um, endeared to us. I mean, because he all of a sudden he, just the light bulb went out, and he said, "Oh." He said, "Well, how did things get like this?" We said, "We don't know, but we would like to change it." So it only took a year because he worked so hard on it that by the end of the year, you literally could go to the DMV and get your driver's license to reflect that you were Native American. So that was in the early 90s. And then later on, the birth certificates came. So little by little, we're, we're working on this. But um, it's a huge bureauc bureaucracy and it's very, very hard to find every piece of it to change. Um, we actually have a word for this or a term for this. It's called document documentational genocide. You know, if you're not recorded on paper, you don't exist. And that is exactly what it is. Um, so we have the Indigenous Women's Alliance of South Carolina. And through them, we have done, like I said, all of these surveys. We have found that we have an 89% rate of indigenous women in South Carolina who have who are domestic violence survivors. We have a 90% rate of Native American women or indigenous women in South Carolina who are sexual assault survivors. We just found out on the last survey that we did, sometimes we find out things that are we weren't looking for. And we try to make sure that our surveys are very uh, are not biased. They are done by the University of South Carolina School of Social Work. We are completely hands-off. They are professionally done, and they are done anonymously. Um, and this is why we tend to get a lot of information also, too, because they're done online, and they're done anonymously, and that people can say whatever they need to say. Nobody's going to know who they are. Um, so we found out that our rate of miscarriage is 15 times higher and we don't know if that's because it's medical, if that's because it's environmental. You know, we don't know the reasons for that yet. So we're gonna have to funnel that down somehow into surveys that kind of give us smaller details so we can figure this out. Um, so the Indigenous Women's Alliance works very, very hard on issues that affect, that, that affect Indigenous women. Um, one of the projects that they have because of this huge domestic violence and sexual assault rate is <clears throat> we have women in every county in South Carolina. There's like five of them in each county, and they are in charge of something called a soft project. Um, we call it a soft project because we sat down together with a lot of um, Indigenous women who had been through these things, and they said, we asked them, what do you, what do you wish would what would change 
or what do you wish could be there for you when you went into the emergency room or when you went to the police or when you went anywhere to be treated? What do you what do you wish was there to help you? What would be how can we support people? This happens to because right now we can't stop it. We don't. There's there's not enough of us. This is a huge and horrible situation. We're doing everything we can, but we can't just stop it. So we know it's happening. <clears throat> so what we have is we have these kits that um, have soft things in them. There is a soft lap blanket. There is a rock that has indigenous symbols on it that they would recognize to hold in your hand during examinations. There are like really, really soft socks. Sometimes there's head coverings in them. Um, and there's certain things that, that are needed. And I'm not going to mention all of it in this situation. And there are things that you would not think about. Like one of the things that we found out was that first showers were extraordinarily traumatic because of the cuts and the bruises. So we have women in tribes now who make soap for us that is very, very mild and will not hurt those cuts and abrasions. Um, during that particular time. And of course we have herbs um, in there that we all recognize, sage, sweet grass, cedar, that kind of thing to be prayed with. And the smell is automatically recognizable and very, very comforting. So we always make sure we have little packets of that in there. Um, these are, it, we, we have worked with social workers to get these in every hospital and, and police station in South Carolina. And when they have to be replaced, one of those five women are called and they go and they replace it. We do not tell anyone when we replace them because it's it's a privacy issue. If somebody were to even know the area, they might could guess who it is. You know, someone didn't come home for two days and then when they came home, they wouldn't talk to anybody. That's gonna get right back to, you know, possibly the people in their community and they do, it's their choice as to whether or not they want them to know. Um, we offer six months of free therapy for victims of trauma. Um, and that is done virtually by a local, it's a local person in South Carolina, there's two or three, that we have had trained through um, the Minnesota Women's Sexual Assault Coalition to deal with um, Indigenous women. These are unfortunate, we didn't have any Indigenously trained persons here, but they sort of work with us so they know what to expect when they work with an Indigenous person. So it's six months of free therapy. Um, we also offer free legal help for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And we're very, very lucky. We are working right now with attorneys that we don't have to wait. We can call them in the middle of the night. We can call them and the person gets called within hours. This is not like South Carolina legal system where they're going to have to get on a list or some such thing. We have been able to just kind of cut through the bureaucracy and get them help as quickly as possible. Um, we also are really, really lucky to work with Skedvasa. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, they provide us with free ring cameras for survivors that might need those um, as a part of training us and women in our communities and in the tribes on how to make a, um, a plan to leave and then how to carry out that plan after they have left. So we don't just give out free ring cameras to monitor people. It has to be women that are literally have a plan to be able to leave and then a plan to be able to protect themselves and their children. Um, so that's like a little bit of what they do, which is a huge scope of work. Um, we have an Idle No More Committee, which is our environmental justice committee. Uh, I had I had never seen a busier committee. It sounds like the Indigenous Women's Alliance is busy. These people are incredible. Um, they are right now working with. Uh, they're on the National PFAS Coalition. They're working um, on specifically how PFAS affects uh, Native American tribes and how pollutants in tribal areas affect them. Uh, environmental racism, that kind of thing. Um, of course, we're finding that to be very prevalent because there's just so few or none, um, for the most part, um, regulations in tribal areas. It's like, it just seems like it's just where people get away with murder because they're kind of out in the middle of nowhere 
So, you know, environmental polluters are just doing what they want. So, um, and this may be where it be, this is where we found out about the miscarry rate. And like I said, we don't know, we can't say that's a cause. Um, yeah, it's just a correlation. So we're going to try to get to the bottom of that. So that is what that committee does. Uh, we have Native American veterans and um, active duty military. Um, this is where we do everything we can to make sure our veterans get the kind of support that they need. They make sure that they know the resources that are available to them, that when we have an active duty person come home, when they are deployed, that someone is there in regalia um, to meet them at the airport, you know, to honor them as a Native veteran. Um, we make sure that we have gatherings for families and we have a great big dinner for veterans every year and we talk to them about what their needs are and we kind of go from there. Um, we're working right now on training peer-to-peer -peer counselors for PTSD. We don't want it, certainly don't want it to be their only resource for PTSD and for things that they need because these are not professional counselors, but we're kind of hoping maybe if we have more in tribal communities because you know what? One thing affects the other. The PTSD affects the domestic violence rate. You know, you can just kind of keep see how these are all sort of circular issues. Um, and we realize that. So that is a very important commission um, committee for a lot of different reasons. It's not just about honoring veterans, which is extremely important. And we love doing that. Um, we try to make sure they get things like tickets to Carowinds, you know what I mean? <laughs> stuff that just fun stuff for them too, and make sure that they get fun stuff. You know, times to spend with their kids when they get to come home from deployment. We're trying to make sure that there's like a family day for them that where we can give them things that you know that'll be fun and they can go out to dinner and that kind of stuff um, when they get back. Uh, the um, 17 to 27 Two Spirit Society is not something I am going to tell you much about. It has to deal with our two-spirit folks who are between the ages of 17 and 27. If you don't know what a two-spirit person is, that is our LGBTQ plus folks um, that are act actually sacred to us. Um, but we give them their privacy. We just provide them funding and support and you know whatever they let me know as um, chief executive officer they need, I try to just make sure that they get and stay out of it and let them have their own space to be who they are. Um, and this was extremely important for Native American youth because you know they do live in these tribal communities that are somewhat rural most of the time, not very accepting areas, school districts, that kind of thing. So we really want to give them a place to kind of all find each other and get together and do the you know peer to peer kind of support thing. So we let them decide, you know, what's important to them and what they want to do. I'll see. Did I miss any? We have so many more committees, and I probably missed some. Did you want to take um, some questions now? That I have to open some things that I yeah, that'd be now. great. Because I think I'm out of wind here. I hope that I um, explained everything well enough. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to start asking a question about the, the, the assault victim package that you prepared. You call it soft? The soft project. project. So FP, because soft everything project. it touches the body yeah. should be soft and non-irritating. And you have cooperation with all the judicial districts? No, we don't. It's not. It's social workers okay. and hospitals and other places. We don't use a judicial like district. Okay. 16 judicial districts. They run for office. Yeah, they do. <laughs> well, people in Zoom land are in the room there. Raise your hand or speak up and, and ask questions to either um, to Terrence or to uh, Chris. Hi, I was interested to know if there are among those committees any that focus on substance abuse issues. We hear that the reservations um, occasionally will hear a, a news story that, that they have issues. Uh, what is that? How is that being handled, if at all, in our state? I'm going to be honest with you. It's not being handled. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that we have not been able to find resources for, um, manpower for. Um, I know that the Catawba are doing an extremely good job with that. And we're kind of hoping to emulate their 
program and sort of see that funnel down um, if possible. Um, there is another issue right now that I forgot to mention, and I'll talk about that in a little bit that, that has kind of come to the forefront. Uh, and and the, especially the fentanyl issue right now is sort of a competing issue. Um, I know that we've had two deaths since January that were fentanyl related um, in the tribes, and it's it's been devastating. Um, one of them was related to the missing and murdered indigenous women issue, and, and that is something I'm going to talk about. But um, I wish I could give you this really, really rosy program that we, we're rolling out and, and tell you what a great job we're doing. We're not. We're not. It's something we just can't get to. And I'm going to be very, very honest about it. We just haven't been able to address it at all. Terrence, last time you were here, you talked very movingly about um, standing room. Your experiences, um, uh, some thoughts about moving forward and how those kind of issues are going to probably continue. Yeah. I think Standing Rock was probably the seminal um, example of what we as a people are capable of doing in this century. Um, I don't know how many were familiar with the Standing Rock situation, but it had to do with um, the code access pipeline, yeah, Enbridge um, Transfer Energy Company that wanted to place an oil pipeline under uh, the Missouri River and over the Oglala Aquifer. The Oglala Aquifer provides 33% 33, 33 of the nation's drinking water. Uh, everybody thought that's you know, the Standing Rock movement was just about the Standing Rock tribe trying to preserve their drinking water. Well, yeah, that's true. But that was also your drinking water. It's not just ours. Um, and that was, you know, water is sacred to us, period. It doesn't belong to anybody. You know, that didn't, it just didn't make sense to us. Um, and they're trying to tell us that pipelines don't break. They break every day. So I think that... Um, that was an extremely intense and revealing thing in my life. It was intense because I had never um, endured the violence that I had heard about from my family. Um, I had um, I had seen on very small scales on my mom's reservation, um, but I had never myself actually been attacked or felt like I was in a war simply because I was a Native American person. Standing Rock, this is where there were um, water cannons, concussive grenades, um, rubber bullets. Um, it, it was extraordinary. Dogs, I mean, that, I think that was the worst thing I had ever seen was when they just set dogs out. Um, dogs are completely sacred to us. We can't even imagine hurting a dog. Um, to us, they had like the most purest spirit. And then to see these dogs who have been, to us, abused to be so mean and attack. Um, and I grew up training um, German shepherds and um, Belgian Malinois because my dad was in the military. And that's where we got our dogs from, was from the military police. And my dad would bring home a puppy. We'd get to play with it for two weeks. Then it went back <laughs> to training and it was gone for two weeks and then we were trained with the dog. So that's how I learned how to train dogs. And these dogs were not trained like I had learned to train dogs. These dogs were trained in a way I could tell was abusive. I mean, they, they were just psychotic, literally psychotic and watching these dogs and then watching them like bite people and, you know, have bloody mouths. It was, it was, it was, um, I, <laughs> I've had therapy for this because it, it was PTSD inducing, there's no doubt about it. Um, I think that, that that violence probably showed everyone in the United States what it is going to take to stand up for the kind of changes that are going to be necessary um, to save the environment and especially water. 
Um, water is going, I think, begin to become one of the biggest issues in the world in the next few generations. Um, and I think that what I learned was to bring it home because I was asked when I was there, what, what are you doing where you live? I wasn't doing anything. Um, and this is when we formed, this is when we formed the Idle No More Committee, Environmental Justice Committee. And part of I don't know more scope of work is they've worked with all of the river keepers in South Carolina and those river keepers keep each tribe informed in their area of what is going on in the rivers that are near them. So we're staying very aware of what is going on with the water with the water in South Carolina and you know should there be a need to protect it we're ready to stand up in many different ways, you know, legislatively, have, you know, however we kind of have to, you know, we we're well trained now. Um, <clears throat> And how to do this is, I think, is an, uh, another movement also that very much rocked the um, how to uh, protest successfully, you know, how to uh, street medicine training, um, how to um, stand in front of an armed or a militant type. Um, oppressor and be successful in what you're doing and not get yourself killed. You know, we have people literally coming in and training groups of us. Um, so there were 5,000 people and almost every tribe in the United States participated, South American indigenous people, Alaskan indigenous people, Hawaiian indigenous people flew over. Every, the Sami came, um, that was pretty amazing. You know, we had so many indigenous people there. Now we've all had the same kind of training. So I think that, you know, we're pretty much ready to stand up to anything because we even taught our kids. You know, people are keep teaching their children now. And where's the project now, the pipeline project? Um, it's ongoing. Um, I mean, it was stopped for a while. And President, yeah, President Obama, once he didn't know about it. Um, while this was going on, he was in Malaysia. So when he was in Malaysia, a Malaysia reporter actually stood up him, to him and said, well, what do you think about what's going on in, Stan in Standing Rock Reservation? He said, I don't, he literally said he didn't know. He said, what, what's going on? So I think at that point, uh, from what I understand, when he flew back, he got a whole bunch of briefings. He literally hit the ground running. I have to say, um, a lot of people say he didn't do anything, but he did what he could do. He um, turned it over to... Um, no, he turned it over, first of all, to um, the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah. And then um, what's the environmental agency? Uh, I don't remember. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the EPA. And then somewhere else. And so what happened was they all got together and like, okay, what can we do to stop this now? Because it was going to take a lot of red tape. So they cut through a lot of red tape. And what happened was... Um, two or three things happened. The main thing was that there had to be an environmental study. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline had even started working without a permit. They had no permit. And they were literally by, I think it was like the third or fourth day, they had gotten really, really close to what were um, remains. Um, and then there was also remains across at like a little part of the river up on a mound that we were trying to keep them away from. Um, and this was out without even a permit. Um, also, by the way, you can do this in South Carolina legally. You don't have to have a permit to get started on, the, on a project mm -hmm. or an environmental study. So thank your legislators. Um, so that environmental study was going to take a very, very long period of time, probably three years. It's enough to make them quit because they were going to lose millions. They were already, the point with us is every day they were losing millions of dollars and we loved it. It was like, how much money did they lose today? Because that's really how you hurt people is in the pocket sometimes. Um, our whole issue wasn't to show the whole world we were mad. It was how many days can we cost them money before they decide it's enough to stop. It's cost, it was draining us. We can't do this anymore. It's like, how long can we hang in here before they literally come with tanks and make us move? Maybe by then. Um, but unfortunately, when the next president came into office, it, it, he immediately signed an order that said, 
that didn't have to happen and they immediately went back to work. So um, that pipeline is not only running there, um, it's coming through Appalachian. That's called line five. So there's a lot of Native Americans in that in that area that are working. You can you can kind of Google line five right now. Did that answer your question? That's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to all of this. So. Any questions out there on Zoom land? Hi, I'm Hillary. Um, I have several friends who are connected to work trying to stop Cop City in Atlanta. Um, working with indigenous activists and other kinds of activists. Um, I also do work around criminal legal issues and I'm curious about uh, alternate justice systems in, in South Carolina with indigenous groups, uh, especially restorative justice. Could you share anything if, if you're able to about that? The committee that I didn't mention that's our, one of our busiest committees right now is the restorative justice committee. They do a lot of different things. Um, our scope of work probably isn't exactly what you were thinking. First, I'll address the alternative justice type thing. Um, we have two tribes with their own court systems, but they are trained to the South Carolina court system and they do use South Carolina law. It's just better that, you know, it's members of the tribe who kind of better understand what's going on can carry these things out so that's kind of as far as that goes the guitar are federally recognized they have their own police force um and are forming a pretty good justice system the waccamaw also have uh, their own magistrate and they have their own um police officers there's only two um and that's a pretty big tribe but you know for now that's all the state is willing to trade i mean to train i mean we either that or we pay to have them trained. So sometimes it's an, it's an issue literally of where are we gonna find the funding to do this? Um, so it's a little bit difficult at times for us to do anything else with that particular um, issue. Uh, I know that doesn't answer that well, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. So our reformative justice committee uh, started out uh, in the prison system and it was called the South Carolina Native American Prison Project where we had learned that uh, prisoners in South Carolina were not able to express their spirituality in, within the prison system. So again, this is like going to every social worker in South Carolina that's associated with the hospital. Um, we had to go to every um, board of a um, prison system in South Carolina. Maybe it might be federal, uh, it might be county, so it's all different types of systems and different people and um, explain to them why this is important and then set up a system of how to recognize Native American symbols and why they would have certain things and not to put their hands in their medicine bags and then um, to have peer-to-peer -peer support. So we'd have somebody that would come in um, on a monthly basis that would meet with all the Native American prisoners so they could have ceremony or whatever it is they felt that they needed. Um, and, you know, the first thing they said to us when we asked about that, they said, well, we have a chaplain and we have a rabbi. I'm sorry, that doesn't apply to us. <laughs> so, we really had to do a lot of convincing <laughs> with that. Um, that is still happening. But right now, um, because we did another survey and because there's a situation going on with missing and murdered Indigenous women, this is something you can research on the Internet. Um, there's a great deal of information about it. There are over 6,000 Native American women missing um, in the United States. The Justice Department literally has two cases, has taken on two full cases. Um, we saw this map that Anonymous did about four years ago that have these big red blobs all in the United States and Canada. And it said, these are the areas that police report missing and murdered Indigenous women. And, you know, it's pretty much a big red bloody map at that point because it was so many. Um, and then our attention was very much focused on the fact that there was a blob right on the border of South Carolina. And we thought, how do they know this? Well, we really couldn't get any answers with that. So kind of thought about it and said, I wonder if we, we, we started thinking, we wonder if we really have a problem here. You know, is there a problem? We need to know about it. So the Indigenous Women of South Carolina started working at, at ex, the inception of 
the um, excuse me, Attorney General's um, task force on human trafficking, because a lot of this deals with human trafficking. And we started finding out things like um, they have brought um, four women into a safe house in a certain county. Two of them were Native American. And then they have brought people into a safe house here. One of them, those were huge numbers for just, for a small population. And you're talking about half somebody in a, sa in a safe house, maybe it's only four, but two of them are. So we started thinking, eh, we need to find out what's going on. So we did a pretty comprehensive survey uh, or pretty intensive survey. And what we found out was, I'll just give you some short statistics, 53% of um, families in South Carolina had either a missing or a murder female family. On um, 49% of Native American families within the last 30 years had a missing female family member. And the reason why we asked by decade is because this goes back to Pocahontas. I mean, this is an issue as old as this country and our association with it. Um, we we know that. So, you know, we when we got those numbers, we were terrified. And we could not figure out what, where we were going to go with that. So, you know, what we always do is say, all right, ask the women. We have an Indigenous Women's Alliance. Ask the women. So we had a summit on missing and murdered um, women, and I'm going to say relatives, because this is missing and murdered indigenous women, two spirits and girls, and now we have discovered also young boys. Um, Native American and indigenous boys are some of the most labor trafficked and sex trafficked um, that, you know, than anything else. It's really appalling and very difficult to, um, to internalize. So we planned a strategic action uh, from there, and then we formed um, a Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, and we call it Relatives because now it deals with a lot of different people um, or different types of people, um, task force. And so that task force right now has, is working on so many facets of how to deal with this. Um, the first thing we did was we are making a guidebook because uh, we, again, you know, when you want to know what is going on, you go in tribal communities and you talk to people that this happened to. And what they told us was, was we didn't know what to do. You know, we, when your child has been taken from you or your aunt is missing, um, you're traumatized. You, you don't know what steps to take. You don't know who to pick up the phone and call other than to call the police. They call the police and understand what happened. What, what are the police saying? They use lingo that you've never heard. You start having to go in the criminal justice system. They use, there's legal terms that you don't know anything about. You don't even understand. Maybe it could take five months to get child's body back. You know, all of this is terrifying, but at the same time, you have to know about it. If you don't know about it, things slip. And this is why these cases don't get resolved. Um, if someone is missing, sometimes what you do in the first hour is absolutely crucial. First hour and then the second hour. Absolutely crucial to possibly finding that person. Um, even if the person is found later, that is still crucial. Even if the person is found deceased, that is still crucial. I mean, you absolutely have to know about these things. Well, who knows? Who, what family knows these things? You don't know these things. So we're building a roadmap right now that has all of these issues in it that people need to understand, kind of a step-by-step -step thing um, that we can actually hand someone. Also, too, we're putting it on the internet. Um, and when we do that, we don't want it to just be for us. We want it to be for anybody this happens to. We want a mother to be able to go to her computer at three o'clock in the morning and be able to find this. It's like, what do I do? Um, we are also working with uh, law enforcement that are in tribal communities. We're trying to build relationships between the tribal communities and law enforcement. There, are, Like I said, there's so many facets to this. We are working with coroners because Again, that othering situation, we just did another um, survey and that was specifically on othering and we wanted kind of wanted to see how this related to the missing and murdered indigenous women situation as well because the coroner doesn't know that this person is Native American 
you know, they might just say there's a white person here that's five foot seven, but and the native family's gonna think this doesn't apply to me, or that kind of they're, they're gonna guess, you know, maybe they might say you're Hispanic, they might say you're black, they might not know. If you don't have your identification card on you, if you're just found, who who's gonna know that? Um, so we're working with coroners. Um and we're also just building a support system. Um that's it, really important. And we are working with that same uh, human trafficking task force with Lieutenant Governor um, on making an indigenous and a culturally relevant training for tribes about human trafficking awareness and prevention. So this is not something that's gonna take a month or a year. It's literally probably gonna take five, but we have to start somewhere. So that's pretty much what our reformative justice system, our, our reformative justice committee is busy with. Um, I do realize, as she said, that there are many, many other things we could be doing, but right now we've got situations in front of us that we cannot deny and we have to take care of before we can get into a lot of other things that we would like to do. And this is kind of what took the place of us walking into fentanyl prevention as well. And it's just very, very competing priorities there. Any more questions from Ms. Littlewater on the from Zoom land or in the room? John? Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, to, going back to the coroner's piece. Do you know Dr. Maddie Atwell or Dr. Bill Stevens at Richland County? Okay, those are buddies of mine. They're the, they're the forensic anthropologists there, and they're, you know, it might just be a good connection for you to have. Would you mind giving me their information? Yeah, I can give you, yeah, I can give you their information. Okay. Yeah, because we've got several corners that just are being absolutely wonderful right now about pulling other corners in and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, medical examiners. So, yeah, that would be, that'd be a really good resource. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, just very quickly, do you know anything about the poverty rate of the indigenous population of the state? Mm -hmm. More than I want to. <laughs> we did a survey on that one, too. <laughs> Uh, the mean income is about um, nineteen thousand dollars, which is about at least nine thousand less than the total population rate, which is about twenty nine thousand, which is still way too low. Yeah, and they all live in you know because of where the tribes are, food deserts, medical deserts. It just yeah. Well, I guess it's time to thank you and let, <laughs> and let you get back to your work. And we really do appreciate the time. And Chris, you got some words of wisdom here. Thank you for the water. Thank, thank, you. thank you for Zoom land. Thank y'all. Thank you. And I think about the best way to contact and maybe just like CC you on it. Well, let's invite people to go to Thank you, Terrence. That was great, as usual. Um, South Carolina Progressive Network, I think all those letters in there spell political action. I think you can pull them yeah. all out of there. Um, there are a couple of bills in the legislature that we should be aware of. Um, the first one is 590. Uh, it's, it's a bill that would give Native Americans free hunting and fishing licenses, something that they deserve. That would be a Senate bill. Uh, S590, yeah. Um, there's a second one. 3435, which would give the second Monday in October uh, named Indigenous Peoples Day. And then there's a third one, 843. Oh, point out what the second day of October is also known as Bush, right? It's known as some Italian guy that sailed for Spain, <laughs> but never came to the United States. That's, of course, Columbus Day. Um, 843 would make it illegal to misrepresent yourself as a Native American entity uh, to raise money. So basically, you couldn't get a uh, Secretary of State charitable uh, 50, uh, charitable organization designation uh, unless you were, I believe, a state-recognized tribe through Commission for Minority Affairs. And so, um, and then Terrence didn't talk about it, but I think there is a movement to get a South Carolina version of the Indian Child Welfare Act into play. There is. Um, this is um, 
uh, has to do with adoptions. And a lot of Native American children are adopted by non-Native families uh, without an effort, help me from, without an effort to try to put them into a Native. Yeah, and it's American the Indian family. Child Welfare Act states that if a child cannot be placed with a parent, it has to be placed with a relative. And if it can't be replaced with a relative, it has to be replaced with the place within the tribe. If it can't be placed in the tribe, it has to be replaced to another Indian person. And if that can't happen, the tribe has to give permission for it to be adopted outside of the tribe. And uh, Marsha Zug in the USC uh, Law School has been a huge proponent for that. Yes. And it's just fight, fighting hard for that at the legal level. That's all I got, boss. Turn it back over to you. Let's get a I put um, Ms. Lily Lethal Waters organization uh, on the in the chat. Is that a good way to get in touch with your parents? Yeah, that's fine. And um, and uh, uh, Professor Judge is available at his uh, business address that you will find at the University of South Carolina Native American Center in Lancaster, where someday we will be organizing a field trip, and we will keep you posted on that. And thank you so much for both being here and the work that you do in South Carolina to make it a more equitable place. And I do want to mention that uh, at 6.30 tonight is Dr. Gallman's first uh, one of 10 um, presentations of a series of ancient African history. And we're doubled up today simply to get him started because the schedule for his, his um, other nine lessons is going to be determined by the participants that come. So if you want to get plugged into that, we'll let we'll let you know uh, what the schedule is if you're not there tonight. But um, thank you for coming. And tomorrow night uh, is class. What is it, Chris? Class three, uh, and we will be talking about the um, heavy hand of South Carolina's white supremacy and the shaping of the nation and the impacts we're still living under. So stay tuned and support the Progressive Network. Thank you.